Well, good evening. My name is Jerry Freeman, and it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to this, the 23rd Dorothy Thompson Civil Rights Lecture. This series was started 10 years ago to honor the memory of our dear friend and good colleague, Dorothy Thompson. The series is sponsored by the Office of the Provost and uh, is co-sponsored by a number of university departments and administrative units, and they're listed in the program that you have tonight. There are also a number of individuals who have uh, made contributions as patrons to the series, and their names are also listed in your program. And so I want to take an opportunity to thank each and every one of those sponsors and uh, patrons who have, for their generous support, and to encourage you, if you haven't already given and you're so inclined, to add your financial support. Dorothy and her husband, Chuck, as we affectionately called him, came to Manhattan in 1965 when Chuck joined the faculty of the psychology department, which is my department, and a few years later, and I'm really not sure exactly when, uh, Dorothy became a part-time instructor in the uh, Department of English. In 1971, Dorothy joined a group of professional women on campus who submitted a report titled, The Status of Women at Kansas State University, 1970 to 1971. And it's interesting to read that report today and to consider the impact that it's had on our university community, including the creation of the Office of Affirmative Action and the Commission on the Status of Women. Dorothy served as our first Affirmative Action Officer, uh, and she also served later as an Associate University Attorney. She helped draft our policy uh, pro prohibiting sexual harassment, our policy prohibiting racial and ethnic harassment, and our policy prohibiting sexual violence. And although these policies have been revised a lot in, over the last few years, I still see her strong influence uh, in the current versions. For the 26 years I knew her, Dorothy was a passionate advocate for civil rights, and this lecture is clearly is a fitting tribute to her memory. I mentioned earlier that the lecture is sponsored by the Office of the Provost, and while serving as our Provost, Jim Kaufman was a major force in the founding and sustaining of the series. Jim, in recognition for your devotion uh, to our series, it's my pleasure on behalf of the members of the Dorothy Thompson Committee to present you with a small token of our appreciation. This is, this is one of the few times when I got to ask the provost to do something. <laughs> uh, but it's wrapped, and I won't ask him to unwrap it for us, but the inscription on it says, Dorothy Thompson Civil Rights Lecture Series, established in 1994, presented to Jim Kaufman in recognition for his efforts to found and support this lecture series, October 2004. Jim, thanks again. For Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's stay here and do it. Dr. Freeman, thank you very much indeed, and welcome to all of you, and thank you for coming. And I want to thank the planning committee members who for 10 years now have worked diligently to make this lecture series one of distinction. If you go back and look at the speakers that have appeared here during that period of time, it's truly been an outstanding group. It's a real privilege for me to introduce our speaker this evening, especially since she was the first speaker at the inception of the series 10 years ago. So this is a real anniversary event. I also had the distinct privilege of working with Dorothy Thompson for 10 years prior to her untimely death. In the world of academic law, Dorothy was a lawyer's lawyer. And I realized when I put this together that I picked that phrase in my mind without realizing at the moment from Dick Seaton's comments at the memorial service for Dorothy Thompson. But it is a fact that in the world of academic law, Dorothy was a lawyer's lawyer. To fully appreciate what that means, you have to realize that a university is much more similar to the church than to government or to business. Universities operate in a framework of both civil and canon law. The canon law of the university is comprised of policy, procedure, and practice in a context of politics and funding. Dorothy Thompson had a unique ability to serve the university community through the balance of the civil and canon law. 
This was so because of her expertise and also because of her personal integrity. Everyone trusted Dorothy Thompson. One of the many reasons for this was her basic concern for people, expressed through her advocacy of civil rights and justice. This is the foundation of this lecture series established in her honor. It is in that context that I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. There could be no better match between our presenter and the purpose and principles behind this lecture series. Embraced as one of the most influential women in constitutional law, civil liberties, and international human rights, Nadine Strassen is committed to the betterment of social justice. This includes designation by the National Law Journal as one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America on two different occasions. Strassen graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Harvard and magna cum laude from the Harvard Law School, where she was an editor of the Harvard Law Review. After practicing law for nine years, she became a professor at New York Law School and is the first woman to serve as president of the ACLU. As evidence of her broad spectrum of interest and impact, Strassen also is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. An accomplished lawyer, author, professor, and speaker, Ms. Strassen has received countless awards for leading the fight for free speech and women's rights, and she has agreed to take questions at the conclusion of her remarks, and there are microphones set up for that purpose. So please join me in welcoming this extraordinary woman and remarkable citizen to the K-State podium, Nadine Strassen. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Provost Kaufman, and thank you for that warm welcome. I am really thrilled to be back here, um, having left that other Manhattan early this morning to be in your Manhattan. I love arriving at the airport and seeing the sign saying, welcome to the Little Apple. It's um, really, a, 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 I guess, a unique thrill and honor to be here for the second time participating in your distinguished lecture series. And I think it is really a wonderful way to honor somebody that I never had the pleasure of meeting in person, but I feel as if I have gotten to know her by meeting so many of her friends and colleagues, Dorothy Thompson. I hope to help you keep her spirit and her values alive by motivating you to take action on the issues that you asked me to address, namely the many challenges to our civil liberties in the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Ever since that dreadful date, the ACLU has been working literally nonstop to keep our great country both safe and free. With the help of concerned individuals all across the country, we have made much progress in maintaining both safety and freedom, but much work remains to be done. So I urge all of you to join us in these essential ongoing efforts, as I'm sure Dorothy Thompson would have done. So let me start with some of the good news about the progress we've already made. The ACLU's post-9-11 safe and free campaign has been joined by an increasingly, indeed astonishingly, broad array of, of, of individuals, civic groups, and government officials from all across the political spectrum and all across the country. And the mounting criticism has had a positive impact at both the local and national levels. At the local level, the ACLU has been working with community groups all across the country to persuade local government bodies to pass resolutions calling for cutbacks on the government's unjustified overexpansions, unnecessary overexpansions of its power over our private lives after 9-11. This community resolution movement has been extraordinarily successful. As of this week, and the count increases each week, so as of this week, pro-civil liberties resolutions have been passed in 358 communities in 43 states, including four statewide resolutions. These communities represent approximately 55 million people, which is almost 20% of the entire national population. 
The most recent statewide resolution was passed last spring in Maine, and I want to say a bit about that because it underscores the bipartisan or nonpartisan nature of the concerns at stake here. Maine, like Kansas, is a solidly Republican state, as indicated by the fact that both of its senators are Republicans. In Kansas, a pro-civil liberties resolution has been passed by one city only, Lawrence, uh, but not yet here in Manhattan. So you obviously all have very important work cut out for you to make this constructive contribution to securing civil liberties and national security. In fact, here at Kansas State University, you could also join in the growing movement to pass similar resolutions on college campuses focusing on the many post-9-11 civil liberties violations that specifically adversely affect members of the campus community. The ACLU's website contains sample language of resolutions that could be adopted by the Student Senate, the Faculty Senate, and the Administration. Again, I think that would be a wonderful way to carry on the legacy of Dorothy Thompson. I have no doubt uh, that if she were here, she would be leading the charge for that kind of resolution. I want to read you the introductory portion of one of these model campus resolutions since it well summarizes the special concerns to everybody on every campus post 9-11. This university, let's fill in the blank, KSU, has a long and proud tradition of protecting the civil liberties of its faculty, students, and employees. In addition, we have a diverse population, including many foreign faculty and students, whose contributions are vital to the culture, character, and learning environment of our university. Furthermore, we believe that the preservation of academic freedom and open debate is essential to the well-being of the academic community. Accordingly, many members of our community are concerned that federal policies adopted since September 11th, 2001 threaten fundamental rights and liberties. And then, unfortunately, there is a long, long list of specific examples, unfortunate because there is a, an embarrassment of riches, so to speak. But let me just read you a few of the particulars. Granting government agency broad access to personal, medical, financial, library, and education records with little, if any, judicial oversight. Chilling constitutionally protected speech through overbroad definitions of terrorism. Permitting the FBI to conduct surveillance of religious services, internet chat rooms, political demonstrations, and other public meetings of any kind without any evidence that a crime has been or may be committed. And unfortunately, as I say, the list goes on. When we look at the astounding success of the current pro-civil liberties local resolution movement, historians have said that there has been no comparable local movement for national reform since the committees of correspondence in colonial America, which ultimately gave rise to the Declaration of Independence. Well, the current movement is not seeking another revolution, but rather significant reform including through bipartisan bills that are now pending in Congress that would cut back on the unjustified excesses in the USA Patriot Act. As I'm sure you all know, that's the 350-page law that Congress passed with almost no hearings, almost no debates, just 45 days after the terrorist attacks. And by the way, the third anniversary was celebrated uh, or mourned, as the case would be just two days ago on October 26. I've testified in Congress about preserving civil liberties post 9-11 several times, and each time it has been very clear that members of the House and Senate are very responsive to constituent concerns that are voiced through these local resolutions. So if you did adopt a resolution here at KSU and here in Manhattan, that would not only improve the civil liberties situation for members of your own community, but it would also help to persuade Congress to cut back on the Patriot Act's overreaching to allow the provisions that are due to sunset at the end of next year to do so. Uh, I looked up the voting record of your member of Congress, Jim Ryan. Uh, he did vote in favor of the Patriot Act, so he definitely needs to hear from his constituents that you want him to help repair some of the damage it has been done. Uh, we've already seen some positive actions in Congress in response to the growing public concern. 
One example was last summer's vote. It was an overwhelming vote by the House of Representatives for a law to bar the so-called sneak and peek searches that are authorized under the Patriot Act. These are searches that can be conducted of your home, your office, without any notice until long afterwards when it's too late to protect your privacy. And that broad bipartisan vote supporting the so-called Otter Amendment to cut back on sneak and peek searches was supported by almost half of all House Republicans. Again, Kansas fit the nationwide pattern. You, of course, have two members of Congress. They're both Republicans. One voted for the amendment to uh, eliminate sneak and peek searches. That's the good news. The bad news is it wasn't your member of Congress. So he really needs to hear from you on these issues. As another example of the growing bipartisan support in Congress for civil liberties and resisting uh, unjustified invasions of privacy in the name of counterterrorism, this summer the House of Representatives fell just one vote short of passing something called the Freedom to Read measure, should be of special interest to everybody here. This would have thwarted what is probably the single most controversial aspect of the Patriot Act, namely its sanctioning of secret searches of any records, including your library records, based only on the assertion that they are sought as part of a terrorism investigation. No need to allege any suspicion of you before searching your records. In fact, the initial vote on the freedom to read law, that which, which would have done away with this secret library search provision, the initial vote in the House this summer indicated that it would pass with significant bipartisan support. But under enormous pressure from the administration, the House Republican leadership violated its own procedural rules and strong-armed enough House Republican members to change their votes to prevent the law's passage for now. Uh, it's significant that the Freedom to Read law was proposed as an amendment to a multi-billion dollar budget act. President Bush actually threatened to veto that whole Budget Act if the Freedom to Read Amendment was passed. So again, I want to take all of those facts and look at them from my glass half full perspective. We came within one vote of barring the Patriot Act's secret library searches with significant bipartisan support, even despite extraordinary pressure from the President and the House Republican leadership. So next time, we're going to win that vote. This is typical of votes we've seen in Congress in the past couple of years. Indeed, congressional efforts to cut back on the Patriot Act's excesses are being led by some of the most conservative Republicans, as well as some of the most liberal Democrats. The measure to end sneak and peek searches, as I mentioned, was called the Otter Amendment because its chief sponsor was a conservative Republican from Idaho, Congressman Butch Otter. In fact, one of the strongest critics of the Patriot Act is actually a member of the House Republican leadership, Alaska Congressman Don Young. Listen to his extremely harsh condemnation of the Patriot Act. He said, everybody voted for it, but it was stupid. It was emotional voting. We didn't study it. It's the worst piece of legislation we've ever passed. Now, I have to underscore, that scathing criticism came not from the ACLU, but rather from a member of the House Republican leadership. In short, at the national level as well as the local level, the growing concern crosses party lines. So the Bush administration is dead wrong in trying to dismiss the criticism as a mere partisan attack, as it continues to do. Indeed, criticism of the Patriot Act has become so widespread that opposition to it has penetrated even that seemingly distant world of professional sports. Last fall, when the commissioner of the National Basketball Association, David Stern, was asked whether Lakers star Kobe Bryant would continue playing despite the charges of sexual assault he was facing, Stern said, absolutely, we don't have a Patriot Act in the NBA. Here, you're still innocent until proven guilty. And speaking of professional sports and the Patriot Act, I want to be sure you all know what happened after the Super Bowl. 
Uh, here's a story about it from one of my favorite online sources, the Borowitz Report. The headline reads, Ashcroft detains Janet Jackson's right boob. As the story explains, Ms. Jackson's right boob was detained under a little known provision of the Patriot Act, which enables the government to detain celebrity body parts that make surprise naked appearances at nationally televised sporting events. Under that provision, Mr. Ashcroft explained, Ms. Jackson's right boob will not have access to a lawyer and could face a military tribunal at some point in the future. Now, obviously, these are very serious issues, but I do find humor to be an essential saving grace, and I was happy to read from the lovely program um, on the back that Dorothy Thompson had the world's best sense of humor, so I hope she would have smiled at that. Attorney General John Ashcroft, who spearheaded the Patriot Act, said that it gave the government sweeping new surveillance powers. That was his word, sweeping new powers. In so doing, the law just assumed, without evidence, that the key problem causing the 9-11 disaster was lack of government power to gather information about terrorism. After the act was passed in the intervening three years, there has finally been extensive analysis about what did go wrong pre-9-11, including through the independent bipartisan Citizens Commission that released its report this summer. But as that commission report and other studies have shown, the key problems had nothing to do with the government's lack of power to gather information, but rather with the government's failure to effectively analyze and act on the vast amount of information it already had through its already sweeping surveillance powers pre-9-11. That point was also made very forcefully by Richard Clark, the former counterterrorism chief in the Bush administration itself in his best-selling book that was published last spring. Likewise, Clark and many other security experts have pinpointed many strategies to deter, prevent uh, future attacks, and these, too, have nothing to do with increasing government's power to engage in surveillance. Rather, they have to do with such mundane but critical matters as upgrading the government's computer systems, hiring more personnel with pertinent language skills, and breaking down the bureaucratic barriers to information sharing among agencies. And these real problems still have not been rectified. In short, the sweeping new powers that the government now has under the Patriot Act and other post-9-11 measures are the worst of both worlds. They do demonstrably make all of us less free, but they do not demonstrably make us more safe. To the contrary, by diverting attention from the real problems that caused the terrorist attacks and the real solutions to those problems, such measures actually undermine our safety. And as I've indicated, this is the critique that is coming from individuals who have dedicated their entire adult lives to law enforcement and national security, such as Dick Clark. I want to cite another example here. She's one of my heroines, and again, I think somebody that Dorothy Thompson would have admired very much. FBI agent Colleen Rowley, based in the FBI's Minneapolis office. She has been widely hailed, including by FBI Director Robert Mueller and many members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. Remember, she sent her courageous whistleblowing letter to FBI Director Mueller two and a half years ago, and she explained that the FBI had enough probable cause to, for example, wiretap Zacharias Musawi's laptop, and it was only bureau bureaucratic ineptitude uh, that led to the failure of that being done. Now, as soon as she wrote that letter, she was invited to testify before Congress in May of 2002, along with FBI Director Mueller, and I want to remind you, because uh, we've forgotten this history, I think. As she was testifying, literally on the very day that she was testifying in Congress, President Bush suddenly held a nationally televised press conference in which, for the very first time, he endorsed the new Department of Homeland Security. And I want to remind you that he thereby did a complete 180-degree turnaround. Until then, he had staunchly opposed this massive new agency. 
President Bush's about face in supporting the new department, exactly as Colleen Rowley was getting publicity for her withering indictments of FBI incompetence, uh, this was blasted by Iowa Senator Charles Grassley, another conservative Republican, as a deliberate attempt to draw attention away from Rowley's devastating disclosures. Referring to a point in her letter, here's what Senator Grassley said, quote, I don't blame FBI agents in Minnesota for wondering if there were unwitting collaborators of Osama bin Laden sitting around at FBI headquarters. That is obviously extremely strong criticism, but I want to underscore the ultimate source of that criticism here. It's not me or the ACLU, it's not even Senator Grassley, but rather he is quoting FBI field agents who were quoted in Colleen Rowley's letter. In other words, hands-on experts. His strong criticism, that is Grassley's strong criticism of the administration's diversionary tactics were also echoed by someone from the opposite end of the political spectrum, namely Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd. With her trademark irony, here's how she described the situation. With the most daring reorganization of government in half a century, George W. Bush hopes to protect something he holds dear, himself. After weeks of scalding revelations about warnings prefiguring the 9-11 attacks that were ignored by the U.S. government, the President created the Department of Political Security, or as the White House calls it for public consumption, the Department of Homeland Security. In an effort to knock Cassandra Colleen Rowley off the front pages, the minimalist Texan who had sneered about the larded federal bureaucracy all through his, federal, his presidential campaign stepped before the cameras to slather on a little more lard. All that same day, Special Agent Rowley and FBI Director Mueller had made clear in their Senate testimony that there is no point in creating a huge new Department of Dysfunction to gather more intelligence on terrorists when counterterrorism agents don't even bother to read, analyze, and disseminate the torrent of intelligence they already have." Close quote. Now, I've gone back to stress these revelations from two and a half years ago because the administration has been extremely successful in its diversionary tactics, burying bureaucratic blunders and instead scapegoating civil liberties as the purported cause of the attacks. And again, since these tactics ignore the real causes, they are doubly dangerous, endangering security as well as liberty. In light of this kind of post-patriot information and analysis, including from security and law enforcement experts, many members of Congress who had voted for the act on both sides of the aisle are having second thoughts about it. Moreover, in the past couple of years, Congress has repeatedly refused government efforts to expand its powers still further, even beyond the Patriot Act. For example, last fall, by enormous bipartisan margins, Congress rebuffed the administration's ominously but accurately named Total Information Awareness Program. Remember that one? It would have empowered the government to assemble and peruse literally all information out there about all of us. And by the way, even when we kill the program once, it tends to keep coming back. So keep your eye peeled for the latest incarnation of this one. But in its original incarnation, the total information awareness uh, proponents chose an appropriately sinister logo to go along with its name. Remember, it was the pyramid with the all-seeing eye, like the one on the back of the dollar bill. And underneath was the Latin motto, scientia es potentia, knowledge is power. Hour. Now, when the Total Information Awareness Program came to light last year, the New York Times reported that a Silicon Valley executive, Richard Gingras, was capitalizing on this program's satiric value. As he said, you could get the best satirists working in America, and I'm not sure they could come up with anything better. I knew there just had to be a gift shop in this. And so the Times recounted, he began to offer a range of products bearing the Total Information Awareness name and logo coffee mugs, t-shirts, and thongs. Uh, moreover, the Times reported, Mr. Gingras said he would send all proceeds to the American Civil Liberties Union. I'm happy to show you what somebody gave me as a gift. My very own, <laughs> you know, you want to support the cause, I'll tell you where to get it. 
it's great, uh, I don't know, Valentine's present. <laughs> In addition to refusing to grant the government the even greater powers it has sought, even beyond the Patriot Act, as I said earlier, Congress is also now considering several bills with bipartisan sponsorship that would revise various overreaching Patriot Act provisions. One modest but significant reform bill is called the SAFE Act. That's an acronym for Security and Freedom Insured. Its sponsors include not only liberal Democrats, but also conservative Republicans, such as Senator Larry Craig from Idaho, Senator John Sununu from New Hampshire. Moreover, this kind of reform legislation, interestingly enough, uh, a point that was made by Senator Kerry in one of the presidential debates, that it has been endorsed by none other than the chair of the re-election campaign for Bush and Cheney, the former governor of Montana, who was also the former chair of the Republican National Committee, um, Mark um, uh, Ros Mark Roscoe. So again, the administration is dead wrong when it suggests that it's only its political opponents who are opposing the Patriot Act. One Patriot Act provision that the reform laws target is Section 15, 215. This is the one that empowers the government to secretly seize all of our most personal records, even without any basis for suspecting any of us of wrongdoing. It extends to private records that are held by anybody, including universities, bookstores, banks, doctors, internet service providers, you name it. Thanks to the terrific activism by librarians, its application in the context of libraries is the best known, uh, and it was that particular manifestation of Section 215 that was the target of the reform law I mentioned that failed by just one vote this summer. The use of Section 215's secret search power in libraries is especially problematic because it violates our cherished First Amendment freedoms as well as our privacy. After all, who feels comfortable reading or web surfing when you know that John Ashcroft be, could be looking over your shoulder? Worse yet, Section 215 prohibits anyone who turns over even your most private records, including librarians who turn over your book borrowing or web surfing records, the law bars them from telling you that they've done so on pain of criminal punishment, which means that you can't challenge this violation of your rights contrary to core concepts of due process of law. For all of these reasons, last summer, the ACLU brought the first constitutional challenge to the Patriot Act, which asks the courts to strike down Section 215 as violating our precious rights of free speech, due process, and privacy, and we are eagerly awaiting a court ruling. The wheels of justice are grinding rather slowly in that case. As if Section 215 weren't dangerous enough, there's another section not nearly as well known that is even worse. That's Section 505, which dramatically expands the government's power to issue so-called national security letters, under which it writes directly to various institutions demanding that they secretly turn over their records about you without any court intervention at all. Now, before I tell you the bad news about how awful that provision is, let me lead off with the good news, indeed great news, and that is that last month in a lawsuit that the ACLU brought after its challenge to Section 215, we had a judge who was working much more quickly, and the judge agreed with us that this provision is unconstitutional and struck it down in a wonderful decision that is the first time any court has ruled on any of the new surveillance powers in the Patriot Act, and therefore we're very encouraged that this will be a strong precedent for challenging other sections of the law, but uh, we can't rest. The government is, of course, appealing. And, and the court, by the way, has stayed its uh, decision pending the appeal. So this provision is still in effect, even though we've won uh, the lawsuit. And let me tell you what it does. Under this provision, the FBI... I send letters to libraries, internet service providers, banks, 
demanding that they hand over confidential information about our book borrowing, our online communications, and our finances, even without any suspicion that we've done anything illegal, let alone anything to do with terrorism. The government simply asserts that it is seeking the material in connection with a terrorism investigation. No judge is involved. There's no chance to challenge it. The recipient of the letter must turn over the requested records and must not tell anyone that it's done so. Anyone who violates this gag order suffers severe criminal penalties. Indeed, the government has interpreted Section 505's gag, gag, gag order so expansively that when ACLU lawyers filed our constitutional challenge to that section, including a challenge to the gag as violating the First Amendment, they filed that lawsuit last spring. They actually were forced to file it secretly, under seal. And our lawyers had a very hard fight with the government, even to get permission to tell anyone, including even ACLU leaders, even that they had brought the lawsuit. This has not been publicized nearly as much as it should have been. I still get chills when I, I think of this. The lawsuit was filed on April 6, and it wasn't until April 28 that I, as the president of the ACLU, that Anthony Romero, who spoke here last year, the ACLU's executive director, several weeks later, before we could even be told by our staff lawyers that they had brought a constitutional challenge to a federal law. I'd like to read you an excerpt from the memo that our, uh, the ACLU's associate legal director, Ann Beeson, who was the lead lawyer, great lawyer, um, that she sent to us when she finally won this struggle with the government to give us any information about this major lawsuit. And before I do so, I, I want to warn you, if you think Ann Beeson is paranoid in her warnings, you are wrong, because after she sent around the memo from which I'm going to quote to you, the government dragged her back into court and said, you've said too much. You're still violating the gag order. Uh, so here's a portion of her April 28th memo to ACLU President and Executive Director and other staff members called Restrictions on Information Regarding Our Legal Challenge to the National Security Letter Power and the Patriot Act. Quote, the ACLU is now able to disclose certain redacted documents in the case because after negotiations, the government has agreed it will not prosecute us for doing so. And then big bolded language, all caps. However, there are still many questions about the case that the ACLU cannot answer due to the remaining gag. It is imperative that you review this memo closely and use only the scripted answers below in responding to them. Failure to abide by this script could put you, as well as national staff lawyers, at risk of criminal prosecution for violating the gag. Of course, if you prefer not to put yourself at risk at all, you can simply refer all questions about the case to me. I mean, can you believe this, that in our democracy in the 21st century, it is a crime for a civil liberties lawyer to tell anyone about a lawsuit she has filed under the U.S. Constitution? challenging a federal law as violating fundamental constitutional rights. I had to consult with Ann Beeson personally to be sure I could tell you even as much as I already have about this lawsuit. And Ann warned me that I should avoid answering any questions if I want to avoid potential imprisonment. Um, so please understand if I'm not going to entertain certain questions you might have about this litigation, don't hold it against me, but do hold it against every government official, including the entire Kansas uh, delegation in Congress, who voted for Section 505 and is not yet supporting legislation to um, turn it back. I can graphically illustrate the excessive secrecy that the government has employed in enforcing this dangerous provision by showing you a sample page from the government's brief which we recently got permission after another drag down fight uh, with the government. They finally gave us permission to post uh, part of their brief on our website. It was a breakthrough, uh, but don't get too excited. I mean, this was an all too typical page. And, and for those of you who read The New Yorker, Jeffrey Tubin, the legal commentator in The New Yorker, did have a column about this lawsuit a few weeks ago in which he was talking about some of the stuff that has been blanked out included quotations from Supreme Court decisions, ironically Supreme Court decisions that um, struck down abuses of government power. Uh, so this certainly is excessive secrecy. 
uh, I want to say that the opinion that Judge Vincent Morero wrote uh, upholding all of our challenges, including our challenge to the gag rule, was very eloquent. And one point he made I want to quote to you because uh, too often uh, officials who are defending the Patriot Act will talk as if we have to choose between national security and, and, and personal liberty. And of course the ACLU rejects that in our campaign to be safe and free. I loved the way the judge conveyed that idea. Here's what he said. National security is a paramount value unquestionably one of the highest purposes for which any sovereign government is ordained. Equally scaled is personal security, the right of the individual to be free from unwarranted restraints on fundamental rights. So the idea that we're talking about security in both senses, that individual freedom is another form and manifestation of security. I also want to mention, because we do continue to win wonderful victories in, in courts, um, last, just last week we won a major First Amendment post-9-11 case uh, where we were defending rights of uh, a, a, an organization that demonstrates every year against the School of the Americas in Columbus, Georgia, which is reputed to have trained many brutal dictators and violators of human rights. And every year, uh, for many, many years, the School of the Americas America's Watch organization has had peaceful demonstration. There have never been incidents of even alleged property damage, much less any injury to uh, an individual. But the government just asserted, well, national security, uh, we have to search everybody, put everybody who wants to demonstrate uh, through a metal detector. The ACLU brought a constitutional challenge to that, and we won, even in a fairly hostile court in the 11th Circuit based in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Again, the court had wonderful language, which resonates even beyond this particular factual and legal context. The court said, we cannot simply suspend or restrict civil liberties until the war on terror is over, because the war on terror is unlikely ever to be truly over. September 11, 2001, already a day of immeasurable tragedy, cannot be the day liberty perished in this country. So. Uh, you see why I, I feel quite optimistic between how the courts are ruling and how uh, communities are responding. I'm saying that not so we can rest on our laurels. We have so much work ahead of us, but to encourage and inspire you to, to join this movement and keep up the pressure. Specifically here on college campuses, uh, given that the two sections that I've just described, Section 215 and 505, the secret surveillance provisions, jeopardize the rights of all members of campus communities you know, your university can be forced to secretly turn over all of your student records, all of your faculty records, your uh, web surfing records, and so forth, and not be allowed to tell you that it's done so. So the model campus resolution that I mentioned earlier calls for college and university administrations at least to send warnings to all students, parents, faculty, and staff that the Patriot Act might well require them to secretly give the FBI records of books and other materials you borrow from campus libraries or buy in campus bookstores, records of your computer use and certain information about the emails you uh, send or, the, or receive or the websites you visit. That model resolution also calls for appropriate warning signs to be posted prominently in campus libraries, bookstores, and computer laboratories. Uh, for example, here's the recommended warning sign for computer labs, and completely factual. Warning. Under the USA Patriot Act, records of your computer use and certain information about your online communications may be obtained by federal agents. That federal law prohibits the university from informing you if such information has been obtained by federal agents. Questions about this policy should be directed to, colon, Attorney General John Ashcroft, Department of Justice, Washington, D.C. 20530. I mean, university officials are not going to be allowed. It would be a crime for them to tell you anything further. 
The model resolution also calls on all campus libraries to regularly destroy records of book borrowing and internet use, and for all campus bookstores to promptly destroy purchasing records. That way, if the government does seek records under the Patriot Act, there will be fewer available. And this is, these strategies are all perfectly legal. Again, I feel that if Dorothy Thompson was, were still working in the university council's office, she would aggressively be using uh, all of these legal techniques to do whatever is possible to minimize the incursions on your freedom, at least to notify you in advance that these incursions are inevitable until we get a reform of the Patriot Act. The increasing criticism of the government's unjustified overreaching post 9-11 has been triggered not only by increasing evidence that the new government powers weren't needed to counter the terrorist threat, as I've already discussed, but also by increasing evidence that the new powers have been extensively abused. I'm not talking now about the horrific abuses at Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and other prisons beyond our borders where we are holding non-U.S. citizens. Uh, and I know you had a uh, lecture very recently by my wonderful colleague, Michael Ratner, specifically about the Guantanamo situation, which the ACLU is also involved in. But I want to talk about a situation that is not as well known when we turn away from Iraq and Guantanamo to the United States itself, we see terrible abuses within our own borders of innocent immigrants who had been leading peaceful, productive lives, but who were swept up in the post 9-11 dragnet just because they came from the wrong part of the world or adhere to a suspect religion. The most dramatic evidence here is worth underscoring came from within the Justice Department itself. In highly critical reports that were issued by the Justice Department's own Inspector General, Glenn Fine. Now, Glenn Fine is another law enforcement hero, along with Colleen Rowley. He, too, has fought valiantly from within the government to keep us both safe and free. The courageous reports he has issued have shown a pattern of abuses against Muslim immigrants from the Middle East and South Asia. According to the Justice Department itself, before it stopped giving us numbers just uh, two months after the terrorist attacks, it admitted that already at that point, more than 1,200 had been rounded up in what Glenn Fine called an indiscriminate and haphazard manner. Uh, some experts believe that the actual numbers now have mounted into the thousands. In any case, the government's own numbers and the Justice Department's own reports are shocking enough. The reports showed that hundreds of immigrants were held for weeks and even months in secret without being charged, without access to lawyers or family members, and under very similar conditions to what has now been documented at Abu Ghraib. In effect, to use a strong but unfortunately accurate term, they were disappeared, yet not a single one of them was charged with any terrorist-related crime. So this situation, again, is the worst of both worlds. All of these people lost their most fundamental freedoms and basic human rights, yet nothing was gained in return in terms of national security. The mounting opposition to uh, the Patriot Act and other post-9-11 measures has put Attorney General John Ashcroft, who has been the administration's major advocate on the defense server, on the uh, offensive, actually. Uh, shortly after the attacks, he actually insinuated that his civil libertarian critics were unpatriotic or even traitorous. I want to remind you of this. To quote his exact words, he said that we are only aiding terrorists and giving ammunition to America's enemies. And I say we advisedly, since he made that comment while testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I had testified before that same committee right before Mr. Ashcroft. Uh, so I do take it personally. And this reminds me of a headline last summer in one of my favorite publications, The Onion. And this particular headline read, Bush asked Congress for $30 billion to help fight war on criticism. In the same vein, another recent Onion headline warned, new Patriot Act makes it a crime to read old Patriot Act. 
Well, we know most members of Congress wouldn't have to worry since they admitted they didn't read it before signing it. And now that I've told you about Section 505, uh, we realize that, you know, you're allowed to read it, but you can be penalized if you talk too much about what you have read there and bring a lawsuit about it. Last summer, John Ashcroft launched a campaign-style tour to try to drum up support for the administration's increasingly criticized policies, but the tour itself was widely criticized, again, across party lines. Among other things, the Attorney General didn't speak to the general public anywhere. Remember, he addressed only hand-picked audiences that were especially unlikely to question him. Uh, actually, in fairness, I did read on the internet about one forum that the Attorney General did hold with at least some members of the general public. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen this story too, but I want to be sure everyone knows about it. John Ashcroft was visiting a middle school to talk about the Bush administration's policies. He then opened the floor to questions from students. 12-year-old Bobby stands up and says he has three questions for the Attorney General. Number one, how come George Bush is president if more people voted for Al Gore? Number two, how come a law called the Patriot Act actually deprives American citizens of their rights? And number three, where is Osama bin Laden? Just then, the bell rang, signaling that it was time for recess, and when everybody got back from recess, John Ashcroft again opened the floor to questions. Cindy, also 12, stood up, and she said she had five questions for Mr. Ashcroft. Number one, how come George Bush is president if more people voted for Al Gore? Number two, how come the Patriot Act actually deprives American citizens of their rights? Number three, where is Osama bin Laden? Number four, how come the recess bell went off 20 minutes early? And number five, where's Bobby? Ooh, uh, consistent with the ACLU's staunch nonpartisanship and neutrality, I'm happy to make good-natured fun of everyone, uh, including the ACLU. A few years ago, we were running a contest on our website for other things our acronym could stand for, aside from its official meaning. And these are usually concocted by our detractors, things such as all criminals love us and always causing legal unrest. In that contest, my favorite was Aw, come on, lighten up. <laughs> and you can see that I'm adhering to it, but now that I'm here in Kansas, I have to tell you another one of my favorite acronyms was uh, contract, uh, concocted by some detractors that may be familiar to all of you, the Westboro Baptist Church. Uh, I was speaking on Lawrence a couple of years ago, and they were demonstrating against me exercising their First Amendment rights, which we enthusiastically defend. Um, and they had posters, uh, which I really took as a compliment, calling the ACLU the nation's number one fag lobby. Um, and at the bottom, their idea for what the ACLU stands for was the Anal Copulators and Lesbians Union. <laughs> so thank you, Kansas. <laughs> um, in my limited time tonight, I obviously can't even mention the many post-9-11 measures that cost us too much freedom without gaining enough safety. So please uh, turn to our website, which is an absolute treasure trove, not only of information, but also tools for empowerment, making it so easy for you to weigh in, to receive action alerts, to help organize your own communities, to lobby your members of Congress. In terms of Congress, there's a special section on the website where you can give praise or criticism. I love the name of it. We call it our thank or spank section. And uh, uh, I guess Jim Ryan, as far as I can tell, deserves nothing but spanks. But <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry. I've all, uh, in fairness, I have only looked at his record on these issues. So I, I've never yet met anybody that has not been positive on at least some civil liberties issues. Maybe some of you can enlighten me about the rest of his record. Um, before I turn the floor over to you for your questions and comments, I do want to end on a positive note. That filmmaker Woody Allen was once coming to the end of a speech and he said to his audience, I really want to end with something positive, but I can't think of anything positive to say. Would you settle for two negatives? <laughs> I really do have a positive message, as I've been stressing throughout my talk tonight. All over the country, people are speaking up and standing up and acting up, and it is having a positive impact on liberty and security. And these people truly are a cross-section of our great country, Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, national security officials and civil libertarians, and last but very far from least, students and professionals 
professors. So I urge all of you in this important campus community to raise your influential voices. The best way to sum up my bottom line message is the slogan on my favorite ACLU t-shirt. So you see I'm continuing the underwear motif from thongs to uh, t-shirts. My favorite ACLU t-shirt says, you have the right not to remain silent, and in reference to John Ashcroft's infamous invective against his civil libertarian critics, I would simply amend that to say, you have the patriotic duty not to remain silent. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope you're going to exercise that right right now. Who wants to start? Hi. Hi. I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about the uh, court case you won regarding the School of America's Watch. But before you do, uh, I'd like to just tell you uh, in the audience about a student of mine uh, that I had last year who attended one of the School of America's mm -hmm. Wash protests. And when she and three of her, I guess, motel mates uh, went to the site of the protest, uh, I think it was a Sunday morning, they got off the interstate and when they were on the exit ramp, they were surrounded by military police and um, uh, taken into custody into a huge warehouse where they were kept overnight without uh, the uh, right to contact anybody. Uh, she says that they were threatened with rape and, in effect, terrorized uh, for about 24 hours. Uh, they were finally then uh, brought to um, the local pl uh, police station and they were arrested by civil authorities for trespassing, mm -hmm. even though they were not anywhere mm -hmm. near mm -hmm. School of America. Mm -hmm. uh, the charges were subsequently dropped. It was just a harassment uh, uh, charge. Yeah. But in any case, this was a college-age K-State student uh, who, with three other companions, were, were uh, severely abused. Um, uh, she's uh, now at Creighton. So anyhow, with that in mind, could yeah. you tell us more about this? Please um, do feel free to refer her to me, and I can refer her to my colleagues in the ACLU of Georgia. Unfortunately, the problem that you describe, uh, the, the horrible abuses you describe, are, are all too familiar, because we've seen it with respect to peaceful protesters, indeed people who weren't even protesting but were just in the general vicinity. Every time there's been a major demonstration, including in my own adopted home city of New York uh, during the Republican convention with exactly the same situation documented of people being kept uh, for many, many hours overnight in abusive, inhumane conditions, uh, physically brutalized, um, uh, massively fingerprinted, interrogated about their political beliefs and their religious beliefs. And uh, we have been able to go to court and get some redress. Not that anything can ever repair that kind of injury. in a number of senses, not only to the individual who has suffered it, but what it does is to help shore up this incredibly chilly, intimidating climate. How many people who have been through that kind of experience, even assuming that the charges are dismissed and they win some kind of vindication in court, how many of them are going to go out and demonstrate the next time around? And I think that's the big message that is being sent by uh, government officials all around the country protest, exercise your First Amendment rights at your peril. But we are doing everything we possibly can uh, legally, both in terms of negotiating in advance and, if necessary, legally
litigating in advance with respect to both federal officials and local officials of here are the rights that you are going to protect for these protesters and having monitors there to do everything we can to ensure that those agreements are adhered to and then if they're not going to court after the fact. Uh, the School of the America's Watch demonstrations have been targeted ever since uh, 2001. In fact, it was the very first, and maybe they've been targeted even before that. I don't, I'm not aware of that. Um, but it was the very first ruling by any court after the September 11th terrorist attacks. The city of Columbus, Georgia at that point decided, even with no history of any problem at all, that they simply weren't going to allow the protest that year because of national security. That we no longer have a First Amendment because the terrorists attacked, uh, made their horrible attacks. And I'm very thrilled that the tone was set right there at the beginning. A magistrate judge in Columbus, Georgia, ruled from the bench, um, you know, with language similar to this, saying uh, the war on terrorism is, does not repeal the First Amendment. But as I said, also said, for every victory you win, the government comes back with another tactic. So they said, okay, that ACLU is one, we're forced to allow this protest. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to force everybody who wants to demonstrate to go through a metal detector. That's what happened in 2002, and that's the case that we just won on appeal. You ask for more information about it. Um, um, the little squib I have here says that they were uh, going to search all individuals participating. Uh, the ACLU argued that the searches were unconstitutional because there was no individualized suspicion. Also that it would cause mass delays and congestion. Even if each protester could speed through the security checkpoints in a minute, it would take more than 80 hours for all protesters to make it through the two planned checkpoints. So again, it's effectively preventing that kind of free speech from taking place. And um, it's a very heartening victory. Um, if you like, I can give you a URL where you can actually look at the opinion yourself. And, and by all means, please do feel free to refer your student to me, and Strassen at ACLU.org. Hi. Hello. Um, I was wondering, um, just as you spoke, the, uh, our, our civil liberties are, are pretty much under constant attack, and the ACLU has done much to defend them, but I was curious as to why the ACLU has been hesitant to take up cases on the Second Amendment. I knew that you were going to ask about that. Um, first of all, the ACLU, I, I'm going to give you a very complete answer because it's a very important question. I am asked it in every audience. The ACLU is not the American Constitutional Law Society. We're the American Civil Liberties Union. So for us, the Constitution is a tool that we can use in some cases to defend what we believe to be fundamental civil liberties. Uh, but if we believed that there was a right to unregulated gun ownership, it wouldn't matter whether the Second Amendment said that or not. We would then lobby for a statute that said it. As you probably know, the Second Amendment has been consistently interpreted by the court as not giving any individual right to gun ownership, but only protecting the right in the context of a well-regulated militia. You probably know it by heart, but for the rest of the audience, it says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And it seems to me, I've read a lot of historical documents, too, about what those words meant, uh, what the purpose was of the framers, and I am convinced that the Second Amendment is correctly interpreted as not guaranteeing an individual right to bear arms. But for us, that's beside the point, because, you know, if the First Amendment was interpreted as not protecting free speech, we'd be lobbying for a constitutional amendment that would do that. So for us, the question is, should there be? Uh, such an unregulated right, and, and our answer is no, which really is not surprising because we don't even argue that there should be an absolute unqualified right to freedom of speech. There should be uh, certain regulations. For example, if to go back to our namesake of our lecture here, Dorothy Thompson, who was so effective in, in putting in place codes about sexual harassment and racial harassment, uh, the free speech of a professor does not include the right to make racially or sexually harassing remarks to a student. Um, likewise, I think some 
uh, regulations on gun ownership are, are improper and should be opposed, but others uh, are proper. And we have often collaborated with the uh, Gun Owners of America, the Second Amendment Foundation, the National Rifle Association, all of the gun owners groups, because we do have a lot of overlapping concerns about individual privacy. Uh, they have been wonderful allies with us down the line in a, a, opposing government overreaching post 9-11. Um, they've been wonderful allies and we've agreed with them that uh, too often people in this country have been killed just because they are exercising what is now their lawful right to possess arms. Uh, the best known examples are Waco and Ruby Ridge, but uh, there have been many others that are much less well publicized. So there is a lot of common concern, but I would say the difference is that we are not absolutists. We're not going to oppose all regulations. wondering about your thoughts on the Bush administration's, um, I would say, blatant refusal to admit, um, I guess, peaceful protesters into their um, rallies. Anyone wearing a John Kerry t-shirt button has been arrested, thrown out, and they're also making um, attendees sign oaths. Yeah. I'm so happy that this has gotten publicized recently, and, and most of the stories that I've heard have quoted ACLU lawyers because we have been tracking this for a long time now. In fact, it started even before the campaign uh, season. It was a, a policy that we've documented to, to the extent of actually bringing a nationwide class action lawsuit against the Secret Service, which is the law enforcement group that protects not only the president, but the vice president, other members of uh, the administration. And the pattern that we've documented is that there are one, uh, the, this, the squelching of dissent, uh, the silencing, the pushing off the cameras takes one of two forms. And it's the Secret Service, the national level police, working with the local officials all around the country. They'll do a screening of the area. and. The first version of the policy is that anybody who's carrying any kind of sign or wearing any kind of message t-shirt is pushed out of the view of the camera, out of the view of the speaker. Uh, and that's really important in terms of the television audience. The even more pernicious variation on it is that there will be a distinction between those who have pro-administration messages and those who have negative messages and the, those with the negative messages, quote unquote, are pushed out of the camera view to create this illusion that there is, you know, unanimity and no dissent against the administration's policies. And, you know, they're the more dramatic examples that, that you've referred to. This is a clear violation of what the Supreme Court has called the bedrock of our free speech jurisprudence. It's a principle that lawyers call viewpoint neutrality, that government may never silence speech merely because it disagrees with or is offended by or dislikes the message that the speech is conveying. So this is another area where I'm confident that when the court finally decides, a little superstitious, so let me knock wood, uh, we should definitely win. But in the meantime, enormous damage is being done because there uh, the public is, first of all, the public is not, those who are at the demonstrations, are, they're not able to go, right? They're being thrown out. They're not able to convey their message to the speaker. They're not able to convey their message to the larger television audience, and that can have an impact on the election, so it's undermining the democratic process as well as individual freedom of speech. And it also intimidates people or discourages them from going out the next time. So I understand that enormous damage is being done. Again, we're trying in every single city to negotiate with those with local law enforcement, you know, say, you do you want to be part of this lawsuit? Do you want to have to pay damages? Do you want the embarrassment? Um, but it really hasn't been too effective. We're, we're, we're forced to, to go to court. Um, my question is going to have to do with separation of church and state. And I want to put a little information before my question, if you don't mind. First of all, I had, my bachelor's degree was a triple major in history, psychology, and theology. So I come with a certain amount of prejudice, all right? I would um, say knowledge, right? Yeah. Well, what I noticed about the Patriot Act, after living in Europe for 16 years and returning and 
being faced with the Patriot Act was, was there, there was definitely, uh, in my point of view, a theological point of view also being expressed in that law. And it had to do with a concept of Christology where, where you are not freed, but rather you, you are sinful and therefore you must be controlled. And what I see continuing to grow out of that, for example, here tonight, you've got the choir. I know a lot of people in this audience. They're all people who work for civil rights. At the same time, over at the Union, there are numerous collections of fundamental Christians meeting tonight for their weekly prayer meetings. How can we get our message through to them mm -hmm. that what we stand for is not a threat to them mm -hmm. as much as they are a threat to us? As a Unitarian, I really have concerns about that. My religious belief is just negated by them, and I see constant attempts at making law, jurisprudenza, based on theocratic ideas, which I do not believe goes to our Constitution. So my question is, how can we begin to have a discussion between these two groups? Can we? Uh, that's a fascinating background and interesting question. Just you know, commenting on the background point that you made, there's a very long op-ed in today's New York Times by somebody who uh, describes himself as a Baptist. I don't know whether he's a theologian or not, but he's written a lot on these issues. And he analyzes a book that George W. Bush apparently reads every day for a spiritual message that goes back to the early 20th century. And he analyzed that writer's take on Christianity from exactly the perspective you have, that people need to be controlled and we need to suffer and that's why all the killing in Iraq is fine because it's just part of the overall message of control. Uh, I think you would enjoy it. Well, maybe you could have written it yourself. Um, on the point, you know, the ACLU is always trying to work in coalitions with uh, as diverse a group as possible. I've mentioned how we've worked with the gun owners' rights organizations. That surprises some people. We've also forged bonds with some religious right organizations um, specifically around these issues because a lot of, but, but then I want to say something about issues specifically relating to church and state, but on the post 9-11 issues, along with other conservatives, many religious right organizations deeply cherish individual privacy. Oh, to give one example, uh, the national ID card, many of them believe that it has something to do with the mark of Satan. You would know the theological concern there. So specifically from a religious point of view, they oppose giving the government that information. That's fine. You know, I've written letters and testified together uh, with leaders of those organizations on this issue, which is a very important one because the 9-11 Commission legislation is probably going to include a proposal for a national ID card. Um, they've also been, not surprisingly, very concerned about individual uh, religious liberty and um, therefore the power that I mentioned that John Ashcroft decreed in new guidelines that he issued for government surveillance in the spring of 2002 allowing the secret infiltration of every meeting including political meetings including religious services. Now we know which religions are going to be targeted. Probably, you know, Unitarians may be targeted too, but it's primarily the Muslims now. But to their credit, leaders of religious right organizations are saying that kind of power could be used against us too, and we have to oppose it. Now, I tell you, uh, they often preface it by saying things like, well, well, as long as George W. Bush is in power and John Ashcroft, we don't have anything to worry about. You know, they're our guys. But suppose that Hillary Clinton becomes attorney general. <laughs> I love that fantasy, right? <laughs> That's their nightmare scenario. So, um, so we have, in fact, been able to make common cause around these issues. And it's very important because it gets you uh, hearings before and meetings with certain members of Congress that you wouldn't if you were just the ACLU on your own. Um, 
In terms of the religious freedom issues, I'm so happy that, that you raised it because um, this is one of those concerns that I think was receiving a lot of attention before the terrorist attacks, and now many people, including people who share our values on these issues, just are not aware of the enormous extent to which this administration has succeeded in its so-called, you know, faith-based initiatives. Um, just within a month or two after the terrorist attacks, President Bush managed to give $500,000 of our money, government funds raised from the taxpayers, to Pat Robertson for religious purposes, and it received almost no attention whatsoever. Right? I wouldn't know if I didn't read newsletters of Americans United for Separation of Church and State or the ACLU. And I think the extent to, and you're talking about even a very subtle influence, but there are many that are not subtle at all. Um, and that inform the whole agenda on, you know, the fact that we now have the first federal law in history outlawing a certain form of abortion even when a woman's health is at stake purely for theological reasons. Uh, we have one justice on the Supreme Court, John Paul Stevens, who says that those anti-abortion laws should be ruled unconstitutional because of the religious motivation that animates them. Um, of course, the views on uh, gay and lesbian rights um, fit into that. And I, interestingly enough, the ACLU did a survey of our membership, now 400,000 strong, thanks to John Ashcroft. And, um, <laughs> you know, we had been at 300,000 forever, and it shot up. And it's very sad. It's a sad commentary on how embattled people feel, and they should. Um, but we did a survey of our membership of what issues they consider to be most important, and number one was separation of church and state. And I, I think I understand the reason for that, that in some ways it's the prerequisite for every other right. Or to put conversely, once you break that down, then the government has the power to erode every other civil right and civil liberty. I, you know, let me just make one other point, which is those who attack separation of church and state operate on the completely mistaken notion that to support that division is somehow hostile to religion or antithetical to religion. And it's so important to get people who are religious leaders uh, to explain why it, that is as important for religion as it is for secular society that a religion needs to be kept free of government interference and that even what seems to be support uh, ultimately erodes the vitality and the sanctity of religion. And here let me give just one other example, um, the voucher movement, which is still very strong. Interestingly enough, a number of religious right organizations have uh, come out opposing vouchers, that is government financing for um, religious institutions such as schools, because they, one example is Phyllis Schlafly's Eagle Forum, saying with government money comes government strings. It's going to erode freedom of religion. And I think another um, basis for opposing that kind of funding was cited by Pat Robertson, uh, of all people, a couple of years ago when he understood that any kind of government support for religion meant that it would not be just his religion, but it would be all these other Unitarians would have to get money. Um, you know, that gave him second thoughts. So there are arguments that can be made and coalitions that can be forged. Is it this? I've lost track now. I'm sorry. This, this side, I think. Yes. As a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, it's a well-heeled, well-organized, well-oiled organization that I firmly believe has been attempting to overthrow the Constitution and the American way of life. Do you believe that these people should be arrested, tried, and convicted for treason? Uh, if I shared your view of it, sir, I certainly wouldn't be a member because my greatest passion in life is upholding the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and I also don't believe that uh, there can be an arrest under the Constitution, which you obviously cherish, and we have that in common. 
uh, unless there is probable cause that an individual, uh, or in this case a group of individuals, has committed a crime or is about to, and I don't see any probable cause. I'd like to backtrack tra about 24 years when Ronald Reagan was elected. I promptly joined the, the American Civil Liberties Union. But my confidence was shaken a few years later when my consciousness was raised about the issue of pornography. And I read the literature and I saw some films like Not a Love Story and I was deeply shaken by the degradation of women and the message that pornography sends that women are objects to be exploited. And then I saw an ACLU member say, I have the right to see anything I want anytime I want. Would you please settle my mind about this issue? Because I would like to support the ACLU, but I'm deeply disturbed on this issue. Well, let me start by saying that uh, the ACLU is an organization that has such a broad agenda and deals with so many issues that it is literally impossible for any thinking person to agree with every single position we take on every issue. The whole reason for existence of the National Board of Directors, which I have the uh, responsibility of presiding over during eight contentious uh, days of the year, is to debate each other about what our policies should be. And there are always dissents. So I want to start by saying if your test is that you have to agree with every issue, um, then there's no way that you could be a member. And people who feel very strongly about particular issues issues and disagree with us are still members. Nat Hentoff, the uh, journalist, is uh, right to life, anti-abortion, absolutely. And we're a leader of the reproductive freedom movement. He says, well, in the whole context, it's an extremely important issue, fundamental to him. But, you know, there are a zillion others where he agrees with us. Now, I, I don't know whether I can persuade you, but I happen to feel very strongly uh, on this issue, and I've actually written a book, I don't know if you know this, um, and which I would be delighted to send you a copy, uh, and I hope you would take a look at it, called Defending Pornography, Free Speech, Sex, and the Fight for Women's Rights, and it is specifically an answer to the feminist critique of pornography that degrades women, but from a feminist point of view. Uh, because I think it's very clear that First Amendment values are um, completely inconsistent with censoring something whose viewpoint you disagree with. I described that in response to another question. But I think it's also important to, from the perspective of equality rights and opposition to violence against women, threats to women, uh, to also counter the argument from that perspective. Because I don't think that free speech should be privileged above women's equality. Women's equality is equally important. And um, so in that book, speaking on behalf of a lot of feminists, actually, who have reached the same conclusion and have banded together in groups called the Feminist Anti-Censorship Task Force and Feminists for Free Expression, uh, I believe that it would do more harm than good to women's rights and women's dignity for us to be the beneficiaries of censorship of sexually oriented materials. Let me just give you one of, of many arguments, but it's, it's one that's based on, on, on real world experience, which is throughout history, Every censorship measure, including in the realm of sexuality, no matter how benign its intent is, has always been used disproportionately to silence advocates of women's rights, women's reproductive freedom, lesbian rights, uh, and, and this area is no exception. When the model feminist anti-pornography law that was championed and written by Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin was passed in Canada. The very first prosecution was of a feminist bookstore for selling a lesbian magazine, and that has continued to be the pattern. Uh, when you look at who is enforcing the law, it shouldn't be surprising, but I wouldn't want to turn that power over to any other woman. I sat on a panel with Andrea Dworkin, which was published in Ms. Magazine, so you can see it on the record, uh, where she said that she saw a photograph of the African-American poet Ntozake Shange, who was wearing an off-the-shoulders uh, dress, 
that um, Andrea Dworkin said that to her, that was pornography, and that should not be allowed. You know, I certainly defend her right to view it and to not look at it, but I completely deny her the right to take that choice away uh, from other women and other men as well. So I, I, in all seriousness, would love to send you my book, if you'd be open-minded enough to, to look at it, as I assume you are. Um, send me your address at nstrassen at aclu.org. And even if you disagree, I'm sure you agree with enough other policies to still be a member. Uh, yes, with the election only five days away, it's five. Uh, I just want your thoughts on any problems or difficulties you may know of of election uh, yeah, it's, voters being deprived of the right. Yeah, it's right. it's 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 really scary. There is a lot that's going on. I'm sure you've been reading about it in the newspapers. And the ACLU has been engaged in states all across the country. Um, Florida has been a full-time problem uh, with ballots disappearing and you know registrations uh, being being forms being torn up based on political parties. Um, we have many lawyers that we, well, you can take a look at our website. Um, there's, um, there's a lot of information about what your rights are and what the threats to them are. In fact, we've printed up voter empowerment cards that you can print from the website that tell each, you know, you have to be on the alert yourself when you go to vote and here are the things to watch for and here are the rights that you have and here are things that you shouldn't let people do to you. So take that card with you and if anybody violates any of those rights, please get in touch uh, with the ACLU. We expect, as does everybody, that there's going to be a lot of litigation, especially if it's a close election. We have a lot of new voting technology that's going to be used in a number of jurisdictions, who knows how reliable it is, who knows how accessible it is. Um, it's, I'm, 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 I'm very worried. <laughs> Sorry, to, you know, we're doing as, as much we can as we can in, in terms of preparation as usual, trying to work with officials, um, get certain procedures put in place, have monitors in place, have lawyers set to go. We'll see. Okay, one more, I'm told. I wonder if you could say something about the current U.S. Supreme Court and the threat to civil liberties from its composition. I believe I read an uh, op-ed piece in the New York Times about what the Supreme Court might uh, do in the event that President Bush was reelected, like state religion, uh, yeah. a state could ordain its own religion, for yeah. example. Yeah, that was written by Adam Cohn, who used to be a staff lawyer for the ACLU and is now on the editorial staff of the New York Times. Um, First of all, I do have to re reiterate that this is not to be taken as a campaign statement because the ACLU is nonpartisan. And I do have to say that surprising things have happened with the Supreme Court. You know, George Bush's father appointed David Souter, who was the saving vote for Roe versus Wade, and is voting and has been fantastic on separation of church and state and has been wonderful on many other issues. So there's not necessarily a correlation between the president's views and the views of the Sorry, to, you know, we're doing as, as much we can as we can in, in terms of preparation as usual, trying to work with officials, um, get certain procedures put in place, have monitors in place, have lawyers set to go. We'll see. Okay, one more, I'm told. I wonder if you could say something about the current U.S. Supreme Court and the threat to civil liberties from its composition. I believe I read an uh, op-ed piece in the New York Times about what the Supreme Court might uh, do in the event that President Bush was reelected, like state religion, uh, yeah. a state could ordain its own religion, for yeah. example. Yeah, that was written by Adam Cohn, who used to be a staff lawyer for the ACLU and is now on the editorial staff of the New York Times. Um, 
first of all, I do have to re reiterate that this is not to be taken as a campaign statement because the ACLU is nonpartisan. And I do have to say that surprising things have happened with the Supreme Court. You know, George Bush's father appointed David Souter, who was the saving vote for Roe versus Wade, and is voting and has been fantastic on separation of church and state, and has been wonderful on many other issues. So there's not necessarily a correlation between the president's views and the views of the justices that he or she would appoint. Uh, but and it is troubling that George W. Bush last time around said that he would appoint justices in the model of Clarence Thomas and Antonin Scalia. Thomas did write a separate opinion in the voucher case a couple of years ago in which he resuscitated an idea that has been totally discredited um, but you could always revisit even bad ideas and it was that the First Amendment's non-establishment clause guaranteeing separation of church and state only applies to the federal government and has absolutely no bearing on states at all uh, so states might have their own constitutional provisions that would guarantee separation of church and state, but if they didn't, according to Clarence Thomas, they could establish a state religion. Uh, now, so far, he is only a voice of one on that view, and in fact, the, um, a group of students is now doing a series of articles about the many cases in which Justice Thomas is writing only for himself, but I've told them, looking back a generation, when William Rehnquist joined the Supreme Court, he wrote what was then a record number of opinions of one, and over time, they got two votes and three, and now most of those views are majority opinion. So we really do have to pay attention uh, to what Thomas is saying, even on his own. But there are so many issues that are being decided by five to four votes now, so that even the change of one justice would immediately result in a change in law. I mentioned partial birth abortion, uh, which the Supreme Court struck down because of the absence of a health exception, but there were four dissents. You know, one change on that, and we would have a law uh, banning abortions, and for that matter, uh, overturning Roe versus Wade itself. Uh, affirmative action was upheld by, in one case, by five to four. In the other case, it was struck down five to four, but even to the extent it survives, that clearly would be overturned. Separation of church and state, um, you know, the, the last couple of decisions that we've won, striking down football, prayer, um, were, was decided five to four. So I think, and, and Thomas has taken a very strong view there that um, um, not only that, that the only thing that it prohibits is a national religion. So not only does it have no application to the states at all from his perspective, but he also believes that the federal government can sponsor and support religion as long as it doesn't discriminate among religions uh, and doesn't establish a single national church. Uh, even on freedom of speech, where this court has generally, in fairness, been quite good, um, the last internet uh, censorship case that the ACLU won in the Supreme Court in June, we won by only one vote. So that, you know, all of these important issues would be in peril. And for those of you who didn't see that, that editorial, I think it's very good and, and completely factual. So on that sober note, uh, we have to, uh, one thing I have to say about the Supreme Court, please, it is not only the president. The Senate has an advice and consent power, and every single one of us has to lobby every single one of our senators that this is their very, very important responsibility. At this point, a change in the Supreme Court is tantamount to amending the United States Constitution in terms of its most fundamental provisions about our most fundamental rights. So regardless of who is the president, uh, we have to raise our voices and make sure that our senators are not going to allow the Constitution to be changed. Thank you.